So let's talk about the title of your book, The Paradigm Conspiracy. Firstly, what's a paradigm? Paradigm is a popularized version of uh, worldview, belief structure, value system, sort of all rolled into one. It was an original Greek term that had to do with some exemplary idea or model or something that's more or less been popularized after the writings of uh, a well-known scientist and philosopher, Thomas Kuhn, uh, who talked about a paradigm as the whole structure of ideas that scientists have that stand behind their theories they usually aren't aware of. These um, structures are the kinds of things that then got applied to all areas of the society when people would, in the old days, have just talked about their philosophies. Now they talk about their worldviews or their paradigms. Let's, can you give us an example of what somebody could point to and say, ah, that's a paradigm? I think if you, if you look, for instance, at the um, educational community, for better or worse, and we can talk about this, a uh, paradigm in the educational community has to do with um, a competitive reward and punish system that if someone can master a certain set of facts, and they can pass tests where they're competing with other people, then that counts as success in education. Now, that's a very specific educational paradigm that would be dominant throughout the culture, although you'd run into people like Maria Montessori who would disagree with that. Right. That debate, in fact, would heighten the uh, awareness of paradigms or philosophies or worldviews. And we'll come back to that because, as you rightly point out, and I share your opinion entirely, our education system is not really designed to develop the genius and the potential of the individual as much as to refrain it from being anything but a conformist. Right, unfortunately, yes. Then returning to the title again, your book is entitled The Paradigm Conspiracy, How Our System of Government, Church, School, and Culture Violate Our Human Potential. What is a conspiracy? In this case, we sort of lifted a bit from, uh, actually the publisher did it, because it was the publisher's title, uh, the title we liked all right, but the, uh, we lifted a bit from Marilyn Ferguson's idea of conspiracy from the original uh, Latin and Greek of breathing together, right. where individuals come together and form their own sense of worldview or philosophy and so on, by being aware of the ideas and values they're using and bringing to what they're, they're doing on a daily basis. And that awareness allows them to get in there and change those things, change ideas, values, and so on, so that then they can see the behavior change on the other side of that. Right, and what we certainly witness and talk about often, and I've looked at for decades now, are these confluences or congruence of people who are trained in a similar fashion, they share similar socioeconomic backgrounds, and they form a, um, a sense of elitist conformity. Some refer to it as an oligarchy, but there you have a shared worldview subjecting the rest of the world to it, even if peoples have very distinct and different ideas of our purpose on Earth very interesting that even mainstream research done by scholars at Harvard and MIT, Chris Argyris and, and Peter Senge, especially because Peter Senge summarized it in a popular book of a few years ago called The Fifth Discipline, and Peter Senge is also a consultant to industry, pointing out that when people get involved in certain systems and structures, they will tend to fall into those as a worldview. Peter Senge's one-liner is, structures of which we are unaware hold us prisoner, so that when you have groups of people who tend to sit on interlocking boards. They go to the same uh, parties and send their kids to the same schools. And in one case, there was a program on, on TV where someone was saying, do you realize there's a, there's a big building in Florida where people go to, to vacation, and Tom Brokaw's on one floor, and Dan Rather's on another floor, and a couple senators on another floor, one conservative and one liberal. And all these people that you wouldn't think would have anything in common with each other vacation together in the right. same place. Right. And so when you have that sort of thing, even if there is no intent um, to collude, and there may be, I'm not saying that, I'm just saying if there is no intent to collude, it would still be the sort of thing that after a while you'd all kind of think alike. Right, and, and it's a form of entrainment. We've talked on the show a right. bit about the physics of consciousness and how when a thought form is put out, whether it's verbalized and articulated and conscious or heard or even unheard, it still exists. And so there's also this physical reality on the level of physics, on particle physics, that our, that our minds are affected by the mass of what's around us. Right. That's a common thing in biology. Entrainment is, is dead common. There are biological systems that will entrain with each other. A lot of times there are, there are even funny ones that people who are working on a project together will slowly start eating at the same times and more, more or less eating the same food. And then their body will start to entrain. There, is a, there were 
very peculiar kinds of things that people would have the same physical phenomena occurring at the same time, and you'd think that that should have nothing to do with anything else. Um, and and we know women, for instance, of menses age, if they live together long enough, will move into the same menstrual cycle. Yeah, it's a very funny thing when I heard that about women who were filming the the film about um, women in the in baseball. Do you remember that one with Tom sure. Hanks and uh-huh. that crowd? Well, Tom was the only, as far as I know, the only major male that was hanging around the rest of the, the females, and that's what happened. A League their of Their team. Own, I think is what it was called. Yeah, A League I of Their Own, the right. the real right. women players, yeah. Right, and so entrainment is a, a fairly common phenomenon. It's just that people didn't realize how much until there was a fair amount of research done. They didn't realize how much that happened in just about any kind of system, from family systems to corporations to essentially socioeconomic groups that are very tightly knit for one reason or another. Chris, just prior to the break, you described for us a paradigm being a worldview that whether we're conscious of it or unconscious of it affects us, our conduct, and I add, and as you point out throughout your book, how we think of ourselves. You've suggested that we live in a brutal kind of paradigm, one that is based on victimhood or being abused. Let's, let's talk about that and where you see evidence of it. I think usually individuals assume, because they live in the culture and it's their norm, the same thing people assume about their families, for instance, that the thing must be successful. And usually we can also look back and say it may be successful just because we have a whole lot of creative human beings. And if people look more objectively at the culture, what we are looking at now especially is, uh, with every cultural institution, a critique of it for, for very compelling reasons. So, for instance, people say, well, the school system is supposed to be educating. It's an example you and I mentioned earlier. But, of course, a competitive authoritarian system, which is what we have structurally, puts the brain into beta, but kids learn, as we know from studies, when the brain is in alpha, cooperatively, and there are plenty of studies of cooperative learning that support that. But the system doesn't change. Therefore, in the last decade or so, there have been more and more attacks on it. There have been more and more criticisms of it because they say... The kids are not learning, and what's going to happen, something interestingly enough that I gave a talk on in 1973 that is uh, unfortunately more prophetic than I had hoped, um, saying that if you're doing violence to kids' minds with a system that doesn't fit them, they will respond with counter-violence counter somewhat blindly. They won't know what they're doing, but they will be angry and frustrated, and so the more marginalized of that crowd will get more violent, and that's exactly what has happened. The same thing is true if you look at family structures that are supposed to be nurturing and so on, but we have tens of thousands of years of examples of extended nurturing families in indigenous cultures, but what we have is a rather isolated two parents, 2.5 kids in front of 2.5 TV sets, a kind of structure we've never seen. It has not worked very well in five or six decades, but we keep acting as if it's, it's successful on the basis of the society. Um, the same thing is true if we go into practically any field. Or the professional life has no freedom and creativity in it, but we depend on those things for productivity. Um, Our our personal life has uh, usually all kinds of things hemming it in so that there's not room for us to be creative and explore more who we are. In every institution, when you look at it, there is some very serious critique happening, um, fairly dedicated people saying, yes, there's something very wrong here, and the dedicated people within that institution are trying to reform it from within so that what we finally decided, Denise and I, when we started looking at this as a broad-based book, was to say, what if we checked uh, the values and the ideas behind all of this to see not what's wrong with the people, not what's wrong with the work they're doing on a daily basis, but what's wrong with the values and the ideas we bring to it, that if we could change those, we might turn the situation around rather dramatically. And so you then go throughout your book about really looking at the recovery. How do we recover our uniqueness, our inherent potential, how do we recover, and I look at it as how do we recover our divine right to evolve. So right. when, when we phrase it in that way and we look at our society not so much as an enabler but a constrainer and an enforcer of points in world conduct that might be different from the values I hold, I certainly don't support bombing innocent men, women, and children in order to get at the Caspian Sea, as we did in Yugoslavia. So then how do you recognize first that most people might be even unconscious of the impact their church or their schooling or their family structure has on their mindset? How do we go about identifying how we are trapped? People will usually realize that there are certain unspoken rules in any system. This is pointed out by a wide range of people from Alice Miller in Europe to Wayne Critzberg in this country. Um, the rules of, uh, say, 
rigidity and dogmatism. It's done a certain way, and the authorities tell you that's the way to do it. The experts in the field say it's done a certain way. So everybody does it that way, and if everyone's, anyone steps outside of that, they're ridiculed. Or a rule of silence, that if something is going on, you're not supposed to talk about it, which a rule, the breaking of which was made famous in a film recently called The Insider uh, about the tobacco industry. Or a rule such as denial, where people know that something's going on, but everyone is supposed to say, uh, to, as we say in the book, a paraphrase of Bart Simpson episode, um, nothing happened and I didn't do it. It's a uh, very often a case when there is something going on that's very, very wrong, but people are in denial about how bad it is. We have a transportation industry that has huge profits and uh, adjunct and horrible delivery. And horrible delivery. We, it, by its own admission, kills uh, something in excess of 100 people a day. Well, if you and I did that, we would be behind bars. But people deny that the transportation industry could be safer uh, because they're trapped in it and they couldn't deal with the stress of being in it on a daily basis. And yeah, realizing exactly. Here's another uh, example. I was on a television show, uh, WBAL's Bottom Line, here in Maryland. And for those in the Maryland audience... Uh, you can hear that 7 p.m.s on Saturday, Channel 11, and we were talking about children who are, you know, accused of murder or guilty of it. Should they be tried as adults? I said, no, they're children. I said, but look at our hypocrisy. What do we do in our Congress, our presidents, or other world leaders condone the murder and destruction of thousands of people? Is everybody all alarmed about how to deal with them? No, we give them more money. Mm -hmm. So even in, in the sense of what you've described, that a worldview constrains our potential, uh, keeps us underdeveloped, at the same time it reinforces our very destructive pathologies. And usually people get to a point in their lives in which they realize that. There's a level of frustration that sets in that people realize no matter how hard they've worked, no matter how many dues they've paid, that certain rules in certain systems have kept them from being themselves, from being creative and so on. And if they try to break out of that in ways that are very creative and productive in certain fields, they may be fortunate enough to have a breakthrough. If they don't, they can, they can get very much more frustrated and, and break out in, try to break out of the system in ways that are more destructive or even self-destructive. And sometimes we see it through violence, as you pointed out, both as individuals or whole societies move into revolution. Yes. And the interesting thing is the personal version of that where people turn the violence not against their own culture but against themselves is particularly sad because two of the keys to making a culture work, as we've seen in even mildly successful cultures down through history, is um, two of the keys are self-acceptance um, and also self-disclosure, where, where people talk about what's bothering them, talk about who they are, and then accept that. Those things don't tend to happen in the culture, and so yeah, there's a lot of the phenomenon of people beating up on themselves in different ways. Sometimes it gets extreme and they actually harm themselves physically. But most of the time, most of us spend a lot of the day echoing what we heard when we were growing up and sometimes even as adults, that we're not worth this, we don't deserve that, um, that perhaps only the few do really deserve to do this, or just simply feel that we're no good and we have no real point in being here. That does a kind of violence against the self that isn't going to make for creative, healthy, happy, productive citizens. Right, so as you then go through your book, The Paradigm Conspiracy, underneath it all, it's kind of like trying to describe the mystery of our wholeness or our fragmentation. You talk about filters and how it determines the shape of kind of our psyche, our values, therefore our societal and personal behavior. Describe a filter for us before we go to break, and then we'll come back and talk about it in greater detail. A uh, filter is going to be similar to a paradigm. It's a, a fairly strict specific set of ideas or values or beliefs that each of us has internalized and we look at the world that way and then we express the, um, that way. So what gets through our experience or through our perception is only what our values or ideas will let through. Those values or ideas may not be creative and they may not even be ours. And they may not even reflect the truth. An example of look at medicine, they know for a fact that the placebo effect, one's faith in practitioner, one's faith in process, accounts for at minimum 30% of all healing. And yet rather than acknowledge the role then of relationship between healer and patient, they toss it out as being an artifact that's not important to the process of getting well. And there's a case where that was pointed out by many people, including Herbert Benson, the, who works at Harvard Medical School still, and wrote the best-selling book, The Relaxation Response, back in the 70s, just yeah. put out a new issue of it. 
he be, he's been pointing that out and trying to get a positive take on that for decades. Yeah, and it's an example of here we have this great treasure of, of mind and heart and therefore valuing intention, both at the molecular level and the way it makes us feel, and our scientists want to pretend that it's, that it's irrelevant to the process of life and healing. So there's a tragic reality of how an old system that wants certain kinds of outcomes, like take my drug and take my surgery and be subject to my routine and don't you dare pray and don't you dare think you have the capacity for a divine healing. Now, Chris, we've pretty much identified that one can apply filters that are both conscious and unconscious, that a paradigm is a set of values, way of approaching the world, and the way one even views oneself, and it's generally supported by our societal infrastructures, whether it's education, politics, the church. Let's look for a moment, though, very specifically at the government. What role does the government play historically and today in really quelling, I think, the the innate desire to evolve and to be more spiritually empowered? Usually governments that have some sort of controlling facade about them, that is, you can look at them and see that they're interested in power over the citizens as opposed to working with the citizens, are fairly disastrous in dealing with creativity and so on. They are oriented to conformity because they have an an approach that uh, makes conformity the kind of quality they can work with. Uh, Again, Alice Miller pointed that out in her books early on when she was saying the phenomenon that led to Hitler was simply to entrench the values of conformity and obedience and all you need is for the dictator to come along, you've got the populace just sitting there waiting. That's the kind of thing that controlling governments will tend to do. They'll tend to foster and enhance that. And and talk for a moment as you do in the book about the tools of that enforcement because I think once you identify how the mind or the mind control is carried out, and it is a form of mind control and behavior modification, people can learn to resist it. What are their tools? In the first place, oddly enough, the governments will usually have a fair amount of control over media, um, industry of certain sorts, and uh, education. So the values that the culture, this in this case, a dominant controlling patriarchal culture will have, will be carried through into the family, into the school system, and into industry. So specifically, the conformity and obedience will be values that will that parents will be passing on to their children. Those values will get internalized, and the kids have all the associated rules, denial, rigidity, silence, isolation that go, go along with that. And then over time, they feel that's the normal reality, that's the reality that works in the culture that's effective, and to a certain extent that's true, the conformity culture will reward conformity. Right, exactly. Um, What happens then in the school system is that those values are not only carried on, but then there's a very powerful reward and punishment system to make sure that those values are very powerfully entrenched. That reward and punishment system carries on into the professional life, so that, as Noam Chomsky points out, we don't have to worry about uh, the government coming and controlling us with guns. We've already... In fact, he points at educators, he himself being an educator, in the form of self-critique, um, that we've already put the values and the ideas in, the, in people's minds and hearts so that they're controllable very easily uh, just by going to certain key words and key ideas. We can talk about traditional family values in the culture, and people will summon up an idea of the, the white picket fence illusion. Essentially, right, from right. Dad at work, people. mom at home, and right, two right. children, and everybody drinks milk and eats white bread. Exactly. That's a fairly, very, very powerful form, form of propaganda and fairly easily swallowed by people because the images are there everywhere so that when we come to examine family systems and structures and find that they don't function that way at all, we still can't get that out of our heads. So that, for instance, now there are some Midwestern states, which I shall not name, They're trying to make it harder for parents to get a divorce without reference to how bad the family actually is where the divorcing parents exist. And that's a real problem because there there are many families in which there's so much violence between the parents that gets aimed at the kids, and the kids always feel responsible for that, that you really need to do that on a case-by-case basis. You can't just pretend that the existing patriarchal family structure, which is a very recent phenomenon, actually, it's not an old traditional thing, um... You can't just pretend that that's always going to be successful. In fact, we've seen it unsuccessful in most cases. And so then once people come to a recognition that the system or the structure, whether it's the way they organize their own interpersonal relationships or the way they subject themselves to very um, 
ridiculous constraints at work in, in the sense of their creativity being hampered because of middle management or it's not their place to have ideas or whatever. What do they do? How does a person go about then, as you put it, within the context of the recovery society or the recovery model? How does one then have choice? How do you go about making choices? Because ultimately that's what you're talking about. How do we get conscious enough to make a real choice about our own futures? Right. I'd like to pretend this is easy and I have some easy formula for it. It isn't and I don't. However, there are steps that people can take that tend to lead more and more to a sense of inner integrity and freedom. And this kind of thing is going on in the culture, uh, according to a lot of people who study culture. Um, The first thing that happens is that individuals have to look into the kinds of things that they're not disclosing. They have to look at... um, pain that's coming from them, from things that are damaging, that are soul damaging, we refer to it in the book, Um, they have to then say, which part of my life and my creativity and so on is actually something I haven't pursued, so it's my own choice, as opposed to something that has been fairly effectively stifled, not only by the institutions, but by their internalized expectations and values and so on. Then being aware of that, to start to say, I need to disclose that, I need to talk to people about that, doesn't matter who actually. Um, A friend is, in many cases, as good as a therapist in terms of self-disclosure. I don't mean that in terms of... And in in describing why self-disclosure, I mean, some people think, you know, therapy and talking about yourself is really only the indulged can do that. Why is that important in terms of developmentally and consciousness-wise? Because when values and uh, expectations and roles are internalized from the culture, they seep into your philosophy and worldview, the, the ideas we have of ourselves. And so we can't sort them out from what's us and what's not us. But if we start to dialogue with someone, sometimes even with ourselves, if we start dialoguing with someone from the outside, we can start trying to get, we can get a sense of who we are, what really feels like us. And so the internalized nonsense will, will begin to surface as so much junk. We'll realize, for instance, that if we're, we're highly talented and very creative, and we had this message, you'll never amount to anything, those two don't go together. Right. And self-disclosure around, yes, in fact, that is what my third grade math teacher told me over and over again because I kept forgetting to bring a pencil Right, and, and that's so significant because most of us do get such a good deal of our patterning from our experience in educational and other institutional right. settings as children. And as children, we begin already subject to this totalitarian, sometimes very unfair and unethical oppressor being the adult. And so the question is, at what point do we become mature? Sure, humans in our soul and psyche. Throughout this portion of the program, Chris, you've been describing for us these filters or worldviews or the systems that maintain them, and then the process of beginning to draw one's real inner self out. When we look at psychotherapy, and I point to it because, in my opinion, we're psychiatrizing childhood and drugging our geniuses into real trance state. You talk, Thomas Saws, I think, pointed out, you know, that, that we are suppressing and crushing our geniuses, and, and you make a brilliant case for our society being in this basic trance state. Describe for us what controlling trance is like versus what some of might have heard of in therapeutic settings as therapeutic trance. Usually, a controlling trance limits the behavioral possibilities of any person. It makes you think you're less than you are. It also tends to affix blame, and it tends to um, assume, because sometimes people come in feeling as if it's their fault or they're blamed or something, and this simply affirms that. And then it shrinks resources for people because they feel dependent on the authority figure either for some kind of magic bullet idea or magic bullet drug. Or, or, or service. I mean, that's the problem with national socialism and global fascism is individuals are no longer responsible for themselves. They look to the government and other people's resources to do for them what they should do for themselves if they can. A very wounding kind of yeah. element in this culture is the destruction of inner motivation by a reward and punishment system, which then makes people feel that they can only succeed by being dependent on those kinds of institutions so that they assume a more and more passive role. And in a government, in a culture that's interested in control, that's a desirable end. For a creative individual, it's a disaster. Then when you look at other institutions, for instance, and you started to mention, I did interrupt your thought about the drugged society, because we see now two-year-olds being given methamphetamines, and if an adult or a young adult were to use that on their own without a prescription, they could end up in prison. Yes, it's interesting because 
Peter Bregan, who runs the International Center for the Study of Psychiatry and Psychology, has been opposing that sort of thing for a long time. Yes, he's, he's been a regular of, guest of ours. He's a right, wonderful and, researcher. And a, yes, a very compelling kind of individual. Yeah. Well, that's one of the difficulties. It, these things are obviously not done for medical or psychological reasons because there's not enough research to support it. It's obviously that there's, some, there's another agenda there, whether it's conscious or unconscious in the practitioners. And someone who is really offering a service to an individual will be helping an individual with self-disclosure and self-acceptance, whether that person's a therapist or a teacher or a parent. And that brings out the creativity of the individual, and so it breaks the trance in many cases. Then when we look at what our culture calls subversive, for instance, when I was working very diligently in a geopolitical kind of forum and we would talk about the right to protest, whether it's through writing or through street demonstration, and we see now, as you mentioned, that if one controls the media, one controls the information stream, what happens when one feels um, unhinged from society because they view the ruling paradigm as being so corrupt? What happens to that individual? The society itself invites the individual to feel isolated and alienated. To a great extent, a lot of people have felt that way. Usually, though, if those people get out and start talking to other people, this is something that Paul Ray and Cherry Anderson have talked about in their book, The Cultural Creatives, that there can be these individuals who do feel isolated and alienated, and yet when they talk to each other, they realize we have similar values. Right. One of the interesting things when Denise and I first wrote The Paradigm Conspiracy, and again, it had a different title, one of the, the copy editor's mother was reading it and wrote us a little note saying, I liked your book, but I didn't know you could tell the truth in, in a book. Mm-hmm. And we, we were highly amused by that because what had happened was that here was a woman feeling quite a- isolated, but when she connected with these two authors, she realized there were people out there who felt and thought the way she did. That can be an important element in breaking down uh, this, the wall of isolation, so that it's critically important in um, any kind of controlling culture to not only get involved in self-acceptance, but get out in the community and talk to people. Every controlling culture will do three or four things, but included in that list of how to control the public is to make transportation and communication so expensive and so dangerous and so uh, much of a pain in the neck that nobody w- wants to do it anymore. They end up just staying home and talking to themselves and each other or talking to no one. Then, then let's talk about the Internet and the World Wide Web for a moment as a vehicle of transformation or a vehicle of absolute and totalitarian control. How do you see the technologies that are now coming online and being used you know, as a very daily part of our life spectrum impacting this question and this choice of are we going to be free humans capable of fully evolving or are we going to remain subject to very destructive influences from, you know, century to century? As with any technology, a great deal depends on the values that are brought to it and what people do with it. So far, a lot of what's gone on in the Internet has been individuals trying to inform each other as quickly as possible while at the same time the controlling elements are trying to get control of it as quickly as possible. Right. Who's going to win the race is anybody's guess. I'm, <laughs> I'm of course, rooting for the, for the informing each other crowd, and I think that the Internet has that kind of potential. In addition, the, to a certain extent, the failure of some other forms of entertainment are causing people to use the Internet to get in touch with people whom they then go see and they meet face-to-face and talk to. That I like as a trend that I run into periodically that people get in touch with other human beings and have that contact. And sometimes the Internet serves that as well. So it depends on what kinds of purposes that the Internet is serving. It's such a powerful tool that it could be used powerfully for freedom, and I hope it will be used that way. Yes, as do I, and hopefully my site, your site, all the thousands of guests we have in their sites certainly add to that potential. When we then look at the future and where we as a society stand, because we have great challenges ahead environmentally, so we have these great opportunities as well, what concerns you and what kind of gives you hope about the fact that, as Sherry and Paul Anderson pointed out, there's about 50 million, I think they said, of of the cultural creatives, people who have climbed out of the box, seen how little the box is and how destructive the box is, not just for ourselves, but for generations of people behind us and stretching in front of us. I think the thing that, that worries me the most is the perception of individuals in the culture that the institutions are great, big, monstrous things that no one can get around, that no one can buck, that no one can challenge. That's not true. The institutions are still groups of individuals who have their own agendas and so on. The piece that makes me encouraged is watching people that just like the crowd that 
Paul Rancher Anderson described, the cultural creative uh, individuals who do go out and talk to each other. It's quite striking that any time I'm working, that I'm working on a book and, and either alone or Denise and I are going out and talking to people, we run into a kind of reality that is quite different from the reality represented on television or in films. There are individuals working very hard under terrible circumstances often, being very creative with limited resources and limited opportunity, and managing to make very frustrating situations turn around and work for them, or just hanging in there until something does work. We see that human beings can be amazingly creative and resourceful and survive all kinds of things and help to reform and turn cultures around. It's possible, in fact, to look at history not as a history of war and political devastation and so on, but rather a history of perfectly terrible, god-awful cultures being reformed, transformed, and even made to serve something creative by human beings who won't give up, who won't give in. Yeah, and you also point out how important it is for us to value our differences in order to prevent conformity, which then is a deadening kind of damper on our really our inherent creative spirit. What a great job you and Denise have done, Chris.